Forward TV. The world is thinking. This rule is the hardest. Be indifferent. As a for I'm a forecaster, not a futurist, because I am a professional bystander. Futurists are advocates about the future. Inevitably, you scratch a futurist, and beneath their policy talk, they are passionate about something. Personal, personal helicopters or rocket ships or preserving their, their brain in a computer or something. <laughs> That's fine to be excited about the future. It's fine to be an advocate, but engage in cognitive dissonance. When you're making the forecast, detach what you wish would happen from what you think is likely to happen because you get excited, you arbitrarily narrow the cone, and you are in a deep, a deep trouble. It results in diminished appreciation of uncertainty and oftentimes in just plain old-fashioned irrational behavior, like Christian fundamentalists who believe in the end of the world. Now, I don't know for sure that the world won't end, uh, but I do know there are some people who believe that the world will end, and they're trying to do everything they can to make it happen. Um, these people have been wrong for 2,000 years, and it doesn't seem to bother them that they have the worst forecasting record of anyone around. <laughs> but being wrong, I must add, can still be very profitable. Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth outsold every book in the 1980s except the Holy Bible. So, but this is also useful because if you think about indicators being everywhere, the folly of other fools can be a very powerful indicator that something was going on. And you can take these and stick them together, take multiple events. When I, once I thought about Y2K for a while, around 1989-1990, after the harmonic convergence of August 1987, which was the happy end of the world, the Branch Davidians in 1993, the unhappy end of the world, and Heaven's Gate, you know, they were way off in 1997, the unhappy end, there was, it was cruel, but there was a bumper sticker that read, so, many, so few comets, so many stupid people. Um, and, and a whole industry has emerged, <laughs> people doing these crazy books. But what was obvious to me in the early 90s is, forget your computer, forget Y2K. The bug in our computer was nothing compared to the software bug in our culture of all of these people who absolutely believe this stuff and built an industry around it. And also, if you look at the history of millennial movements, the biggest impact of the prophecy happens after the prophecy has failed to come to pass. And if we had thought hard about that, we would have understood what was going on. An indicator that I didn't figure out but set off alarm bells for me was the bombing of the, of the Buddha by the Taliban in Afghanistan. When that happened in spring before 9-11, I was calling friends at the State Department and elsewhere saying, I don't get it, but this is a big deal. Something's going on. There is a, there's something happening in the zeitgeist. I didn't figure it out. but. By the way, Tom Clancy did, you know, he wrote a novel five years before the fact that had a, uh, a 747 flown into the White House by an angry Japanese pilot, not by those others. This is also an indicator that, in my opinion, speaks to the circumstances today. We are still, we are surrounded by millennial crisis cults, whether it's the Taliban, whether it is fundamentalist Christians trying to uh, use recombinant DNA to create a red heifer in Jerusalem to accelerate the second coming. In my opinion, the single largest factor affecting global politics today is the cultural effect of the millennium, and nobody's talking about it.